We're rolling. Okay. All right, y'all. Today we are going to talk about counter plans. So I have put together a little bit of a prezi to kind of keep you interested. Um, but mostly, you know, I'm just going to talk about some thoughts about what is a counter plan, how do you debate with a counter plan, um, how do you answer a counter plan, and then we're going to spend sort of the last third of the discussion talking about common counter plans on the topic. Um, so, you know, feel free to ask questions along the way if you have them. I'm going to try my best to kind of go at a good pace. Counter plans, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I like counter plans. I think that they are super useful and strategic for you to have in your arsenal. I think they make a lot of sense, especially on this topic, uh, when there is a lot of debate in the literature as to whether or not it should be the federal government in charge of education, the state government in charge of education, or maybe even totally doing away with any government involvement and having potentially the private sector. So there's a lot of options that the negative could have uh, when it relates to you know, combating the affirmative strategy. Counter plans are also useful because they kind of take the affirmative's best you know, advantage, literally their advantages, away from them, right? The affirmative wants to prove that they have a benefit to doing their plan over the status quo. And so if the negative can prove that there is a benefit or take away that advantage from the affirmative, then they're going to have an easier time being able to win the debate. If they can prove that there's something else we could do instead that maybe doesn't cause some bad impact or effect, then you know the negative has a really um, like an, an easier chance to be able to win the debate. So yes, we're going to talk about counter plans today. Again, Tara said this, but I'm Abby Shermer. I am you know the head policy debate coach at Marist School, which is a private school in Atlanta. Um, and you know I am super excited about counter plans, which is why it says oh, gee, yes. Um, part of this lecture may be a little bit beginner for some of you. And some of you, this might be like totally perfect. So if you are somebody who feels like you know everything there is to know about a counter plan, then maybe you just kind of hang back and wait till there's you know a little bit more advanced sections like answering a counter plan or maybe even counter plans on the topic. I don't want you to totally tune out. I don't want you to be disruptive. But I do think that it's fine for you to kind of let some of this earlier or beginner stuff kind of go and just kind of tune in when you need to. Um, you should make sure that you have some sort of way to take notes. This lecture is not just meant for you to sit there and absorb it. We don't learn through osmosis, right? We don't learn just by looking at these things, but it, it helps to write it down. So have your laptop out, some notes out, and make sure that you are all set and prepared and ready to go um, with kind of being engaged in this lecture. So again, I am going to start out a little bit basic, okay? I do want to start with what is a counter plan and the parts of a counter plan. Um, a counter plan basically is just the negative way to kind of present an alternative option to the judge, right? Uh, the affirmative team has presented a plan, a uh, course of action or policy that they're going to do, and the negative team, one of the options in their arsenal is to present a alternate policy or method. Now it could be really anything, as long as it achieves the same or similar results for the affirmative, the counter plan can really do a lot of things. The counter plan doesn't have to be bound by the resolution, right? The affirmative team theoretically has to support the federal government taking some action as it relates to funding and regulation of education. But the counter plan does not have to do that. So it can be a lot more creative, there's a lot more options, there's a lot of different actors, and there's a lot of different actions that counter plans can take. I believe that this is one of the reasons why I like them so much, because they are creative, and you can do a lot of things with counter plans. There's different things you can advocate, there's different actors that you can use, um, and all of that is a little bit, um, you know, it's something that I find very creative and interesting and a good part of debate. So parts of a counter plan. Just like a dick dad, there are parts to a counter plan, um, and counter plans have three distinct parts. You have to have a text to the counter plan. What is this? It's not a rhetorical question, I'm asking. Who knows what the text of the counter plan is? Okay, no scientific. Go ahead, start the plan text for the act. <coughs> yeah, so 
the plan, like the affirmative has a plan text that they write exactly word for word what their policy is. The negative has a counter plan text that does the same thing. So the counter plan has to be specific. The counter plan text has to specifically say what it is the counter plan is doing. So it can't, you know, just say the states should do the plan. That should not be the text of your counter plan because do the plan is not like a policy proposal. What plan? What are you referring to? So counter plans have to be very specific in the same way we wouldn't allow the act to get away with things in their plan text. The affirmative should not allow the negative to get away with things in their counter plan text. So it has to be very specific um, and outline exactly what the counter plan does. The second part of a counter plan, just like the affirmative, the counter plan needs solvency. It needs to have a piece of evidence, or at least, you know, something that indicates that the course of action that the counter plan takes is going to solve. It's going to do what it's intended to do. Typically, this comes in a form of a piece of evidence. Sometimes counter plans don't have evidence, though. Sometimes it's just, you know, the one and see reads the counter plan text and doesn't have any evidentiary based solvency. And then they read maybe some solvency later. But for the most part, counter plans typically start with a text and then have a piece of evidence that says that that particular course of action can solve. The final thing, and what we're going to dive a little bit deeper into, um, is the net benefits to the counter plan. What is a net benefit to a counter plan? Yeah, so it's a disad that the counter plan does not link to, but the plan does. Right? It's the reason why doing the counter plan is a good idea. It's like the counter plan doesn't do this bad thing, but the plan does. Right? So for something that we have in the packet, federalism is a net benefit to the state's counter plan. It's something that links to the plan, but not to the state's counter plan. Okay? So Net benefits are important. They are disads. They kind of act as kind of the reason why the judge should prefer a counter plan over a plan. Um, and, you know, they have a lot of importance there. Um, we're going to move now to talk kind of about uh, competitiveness in counter plans. And this is going to be a little bit more advanced. So if you're somebody who is just starting to bait and this seems to be a little bit over your head, that's okay. If you want me to slow down and you can ask some questions, it's totally fine. Um, but you know, if you want to just kind of be like, okay, I know and I've heard of some of these words, but I may not want to dive totally in, that's fine as well. I want to talk about where a counter plan gets its competitiveness. What is competitiveness? What is competitiveness? Yeah. Um, it's the ability for the counter plan to be compared to the plan. Okay. So it allows us to compare the, the counter plan and the plan. What else is competitiveness? If I say a counter plan is competitive, what do I mean by that? Yeah. The there's a strong link and the net benefits. Okay. So net benefits. That's one. That's a good one. What else makes a counter plan competitive? Yeah. Okay, sure. Maybe I'm not okay. I'm not exactly asking what, how it's competitive, but maybe what makes a counter plan competitive. So competitiveness just means that it is not the same course of action as the plan. That it is a different course of action, one that is distinct from the plan. Okay. And the first thing we identified up here was that counter plans can be competitive through net benefits. Right? If there's a reason why the counter plan is better, like a disad, to the plan, then it is competitive. And what's maybe the other way that it's competitive? Over here, I can find uh, it. Terms, like if the firm severs and things that like you can't do those. If you can't do both. Yeah. Okay, let's go with that. Let's hold on with terms for a second, but let's go with you can't do both. So yes, counter plans find a competition in two ways, right? The first way that it does it, we'll come back to functional versus textual in a second, is it competes with a disadvantage. Okay? It competes with a net benefit. 
So counter plans, the first way that they're competitive is that there's a disadvantage to the plans that the counter plan does not link to, where the counter plan solves, right? There's a benefit to it. There's a reason why the counter plan is better than the plan. The state's counter plan is better than federal action plans because it does not cause a decline in federalism, right? That would be the negative story for that. Net benefits can come in two different forms. You can either have a disadvantage to the plan or you can have like an advantage to the counter plan. What are advantages to the counter plan sometimes called? Yeah. Oh. What are, well, I'll get back, do you have a question? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. What are advantages to the counter plan called? There's another name for them. Yeah. Internal net yeah, internal net benefits, internal net benefits. Um, internal net benefits are just benefits to the counter plan that maybe do not link to the plan. Can someone possibly give me an example of this? Maybe Cypress Bay, you can give me an example of this. Oh. Okay, so on like a last year's topic, like a Taiwan counter plan, it solves the Taiwan, or like a Taiwan intermediary counter plan, it solves the Taiwan China war scenario, which is just like Taiwan to propose the plan. Okay, so he is describing a counter plan from last year that had Taiwan act as an intermediary, intermediary between China and the United States. So Taiwan would discuss whatever the plan was proposing instead of just having the US and China discuss it directly. The benefit to doing that was that it created better relationships between Taiwan and China. Is that a disad to the plan? Did the plan hurt Taiwan and China relations? No. But it was a reason why the counter plan was good. Internal net benefits or benefits to the counter plan are, you know, net benefits that don't link to the plan, but are just really good things that happen when the counter plan happens. It's a little bit confusing. I sort of understand that. But there are two sort of net benefit worlds you can live in. Common, which is the disad, that's something that we all are debating here, the, the stuff that's in the packet. And then an internal net benefit, which you may encounter, is just a reason why the counter plan is good, but it's not necessarily a reason why the plan is bad. Yeah? Is an external net benefit proof why the plan is bad? Yeah, so an external net benefit is just a disad. An internal net benefit is just like a reason why the counter plan is good, but not a reason why the plan is not bad. The plan is bad. Do we have questions about this? This is sort of a little bit advanced. That's okay if you don't totally understand it. Just know that the first way counter plans compete is through a net benefit. And typically those net benefits are just disadds to the plan that the counter plan solves. So it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. The other way that counter plans can compete is that they are mutually exclusive. And this is what we were talking about over here with the permutation argument. Uh, we'll get to perms in just a second, but the key thing that he said was that they can't be done at the same time. Counter plans can also be competitive if they are mutually exclusive with the affirmative, which just means they can't be done at the same time. So counter plans that increase funding for education, sorry, plans that increase funding for education cannot be done at the same time as counter plans that decrease funding for education. Does that make sense to you all? Like there are things that, that is like literally the opposite. Counter plans typically that compete being, by being mutually exclusive are just sort of rare because the benefit of reading a counter plan is that you have a disad that goes along with it. Some counter plans can be mutually exclusive as well as have a net benefit. But I just thought I would mention, mention that counter plans can also be competitive if they are considered to be mutually exclusive, like cannot happen at the same time. Questions about this? Again, a little bit complicated, but I do want you to have some of the foundation before we move on to some other kind of theory related questions. There's two types of competition in addition to being net benefits or mutually exclusive. Competition itself can come in two forms. So counter plans can compete in two ways. They can be functionally competitive or they can be textually competitive. 
Who can maybe help me with the difference between the two? Yes. Okay. So let's stop real quick. He says that the function of the plan and the counter plan are different. Like the counter plan does something different than the plan. That is functional competition. What's textual competition? Um, I need a little bit more than a slight change in the text. What am I trying to say here? It's not just a slight change in the text. What is different between the plan and the counter plan? Text is our key root word here, our clue word. Yeah, I mean, the counter plan and plan text typically are different, but what could be different in a textually competitive counter plan? Yeah? Like the Not just the definition of words, but literally the words that are used are different. Who can give me an example of a textually competitive counter plan? There's just like a genre that's textually competitive. Yeah. Sorry, what? Uh, like word picks. Yeah, so word picks, right? If there is a word in the plan text that is considered objectionable for some reason, whether that word is bad or whether that you know phrase links to something else or there's a, a disad to a particular word, textually competitive counter plans can include word picks where words that are put in place there are literally changed. They are different, right? You can pick out of a particular word and use a different word instead. Does that make sense? That is an example of textually competitive counterplans. Most counterplans are functionally competitive. Most counterplans are functionally competitive, meaning they do something totally different than the plan. For instance, the state's counterplan, I'm saying this a lot because I love the state's counterplan, but the state's counterplan is uh, functionally competitive. Why? Who can give me a reason why the state's counter plan is functionally competitive with the plan? I'm going to go over here. Do you have an answer, bud? Um, because the, the plan covers uh, like federal funding. Okay. And the state plan covers jurisdiction. Yeah, so it changes the function of the plan, right? The plan happens at the federal level and the counter plan happens at the state level. So the function of the plan has been changed in the world of the counter plan. So that is considered to be functionally competitive. So counter plans, like I said, useful tool in the 1MC and kind of knowing some of these uh, intricacies, this like a little bit of history about this, um, really helps you be able to answer some of these questions. Now, if you're in a theory debate, you're gonna know the difference between whether your counter plan is functionally or textually competitive. Sometimes they can be both, right? So the next step then for counter plans is I want you to know how to effectively answer them in the 2AC. Am I going too fast? Am I good? No one responded, so I'm gonna say I'm good. Let's talk about answering counter plans in the 2AC. There's a really easy acronym that'll help you and Jack Black's gonna help us remember that. This is from when Jack Black was on Sesame Street and he used with Elmo in this scene. <laughs> so stop is what you have to remember. Now sometimes like you might have learned this as like post or pot, but seriously, any combination of S, T, O, and P will get the job done, okay? I like stop because I feel like it's something that you can remember really easily, right? The two AC should stop and think about how they're gonna answer the counter plan using this acronym. The S and stop stands for solvency. You wanna attack the solvency and we'll get more into that in a minute. You want to, for the T, um, bring up some theory. We'll talk about that a little bit more as well. And then offense or disad. You can read a disad to the counter plan. And then finally, the permutation. Now, when I give this acronym, I don't necessarily mean that you have to answer a counter plan in this order. What is typically done first to answer a counter plan? Cyber <coughs> spam, I'm ignoring you. Permutations, yeah. So the P tends to come first in the 2AC. So 
you know, you can kind of rearrange these to make anything work for you, but all of these components have to be present in the 2AC, okay? So let's start talking about our solvency deficits. Solvency deficits are reasons why the counter plan does not solve the advantages the, the affirmative has proposed. Okay, solvency deficits. There are reasons why the counter plan does not solve. The affirmative has stood up and presented a plan and they have advantages to this plan and they think that only the plan can solve those advantages. When the negative stands up and presents a counter plan, the affirmative is gonna be like, ah, uh -uh, that don't work. And they wanna explain the reasons why, uh, uh, that don't work. And we do this in the form of solvency deficits. We say that the counter plan is deficient, meaning it does not have enough solvency. Or the counter plan cannot solve our advantages. That's the best way that you can beat a counter plan. If you can prove to the judge that the counter plan does not achieve the same desired result as doing the plan, then you should win that debate. If you've got a reason why the plan's a good idea and the counter plan does not solve it, then it's a reason why the plan is better than the counter plan. So starting with solvency deficits um, is sort of a good idea in my mind. If you are the 2A and you are preparing your blocks for the season, it's a really good idea to start thinking about, you know, for the affirmative that you're going to read, what solvency deficits might exist for common counter plans. Sometimes these solvency deficits have pieces of evidence that go along with them. You read cards that say that X thing does not get solved by doing the counter plan, or Y advantage does not get solved by doing the counter plan. But most of the time, solvency deficits are like analytic arguments made to try to explain to the judge why the counter plan cannot solve the advantages that the affirmative laid out. So you don't have to have evidence in order to make solvency deficits. Again, I think this is a very creative part of debate. I think it's a section of the debate that allows you to talk about stuff um, that you don't need a lot of cards for. You can make a lot of arguments that are creative and are different. Um, and so solvency deficits allow you to have a little bit more flexibility to re-describe your ask in a way that kind of means that only your ask can achieve the benefits of your advantages, if that makes sense. Solvency deficits, you need to have quite a few in the debate. Do not forget to challenge whether the counter plan solves your ask. <coughs> Do not forget to challenge whether the counter plan solves your ask. The next section is theory. There are two types of theory. We're going to get into both types. We're going to talk a little bit about each type of theory, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through all of the pros and cons of each theoretical argument, however. Okay? So this is just a primer, a top level theory discussion not the full-on thing. So affirmative teams should present arguments as to why the counter plan is theoretically illegitimate. And there's two ways that it can be. The first has to do with the status of the counter plan. The first has to do with the status of the counter plan. Counter plans have two or three different statuses or ways that the counter plan can be run. When I say status, what is different, like why, why do we have statuses? Like why do we need to alert the other team as to what the status of our counter plan is? What does this control? What does this impact in the debate? Take it from over here, yeah? The 2AC has a 2AC structure. It does impact that, but what does it mean for the negative? Like why does the negative pick one of these? Sure. Because whether or not they can kick out of it later on in the debate. Sure, it's when they can kick it, it's if they can kick it uh, in the debate. So a status determines for you when you can kick this counter plan. And so the neg has to pick it, right? The neg picks the status, and the neg tells the affirmative what that status is. 
And that is meant to alert the affirmative that this is when we can kick the counterplan. Conditional counterplan can be kicked whenever. Read it in the one NC, kick it in the two NC. Read it in the one NC, kick it in the one and R. Kick it in the two and R. It can be kicked whenever and under any conditions. The one NC can stand up and read a counterplan, and the ass can spend four minutes answering it in the two AC. The neg can kick it. There's nothing that constrains the negative from kicking a counterplan if it is conditional. The neg gets totally free reign. I think this is the best way to read your counterplan. There's no, you know, I mean, there are theoretical reasons why conditionality is bad, but it gives you the most flexibility when you are negative in order to pick and choose when you want to get rid of the counterplan or if you want to get rid of the counterplan. And I don't think that you should be constrained to some other certain consideration. Okay, the next status then is unconditional. <coughs> if conditional means you can kick it whenever you want, what does unconditional mean? You can't kick it, you can never kick it. It is something that is going to be in the one NC as well as in the two and R. It's an advocacy that you have to go for in the two and R. I think this is unstrategic for the negative to pick because it really locks you in to one thing and one thing alone. Now I get it, there are some times when you feel like you got the goods and you wanna read this counterplan because you think that this counterplan is gonna beat them and you don't wanna have to deal with theory. But in the same way that you might have the goods on that team, they might have the goods on your counterplan. So why lock yourself in to that theory or that status for no real reason. Unconditional counterplans tend to be really uncommon. Not a lot of teams are gonna read their counterplans unconditionally in front of you. The third status is dispositional. This is the status that is the most confusing. This is the status that a lot of people might have slightly different interpretations about. And so my interpretation may not perfectly match every other interpretation that you have heard, but my interpretation of dispositional is counterplans that you can only kick if they are not straight turns. There are counterplans that you can only kick if they are not straight turns. What is a straight turn on a counterplan? Yes. Offensive argument. Sure, offensive argument, right? It has to include an offensive argument. It can, in fact, only include offensive argument. So if the affirmative makes a permutation or a solvency deficit or some other theory argument that's not dispositionality, the negative can kick it, okay? What's the number one argument that the affirmative is always told to make against the counterplan? A permutation. A permutation. So if the ask has to make a permutation against the counterplan, what does that mean about dispositionality? I can kick it. So is dispositionality distinct? It's not distinct from conditionality, in my opinion, because I know that the app will always make a permutation. Now the benefit to dispositionality, though, is that the affirmative gets to make that choice. So the affirmative gets to choose whether or not they want to make a permutation or solvency deficit or theory that's not dispositionality bad. So again, if you're looking for a formal definition here, dispositional counterplans can only be kicked if they are not straight turns. So if they have solvency deficits or permutations or theory that's not um, dispositionality bad, they can be kicked. Again, my thoughts about dispositionality are it's exactly the same as conditionality because there's not a team that's on, like there's, it's just very rare that you're gonna find a team who won't make a permutation against your counter plan. But again, why get yourself into that situation in the first place? Just read your counter plan conditional. You don't wanna have to deal with like the weird interpretation of dispositionality. Don't read it that way. You should just read it conditional. And you get to kick it whenever you want. 
and you'll probably still have to answer the same amount of theory arguments. Okay? Most of the time, people don't read their counterplans dispositionally just for the exact reason that I said. It's a little bit complicated. People don't share a similar definition of what dispositional means. Um, and so if you do run into like a team that's reading it dispositional, I really don't have any uh, suggestions for how to treat it any different. I mean, you could choose to just straight turn it if you'd like to, um, but I think you're removing your most strategic answer, which is a permutation. So you should just make a permutation and live your life. Yeah. So if they say it's dispositional, should we ask them in concept? What like does what that mean? Yeah, I definitely would, 100%, because what their definition of dispositional is could either be wrong or be like slightly different and that all matters for how like if you're planning your 2AC in a certain way and you think straight turning it is going to stick them with the counter plan and so you do and then they kick it and you never ask what their like definition of dispositional is then you might be in some hot water there um, it's complicated it's also super rare but I would always ask what they think the interpretation of that is and then figure out when they can kick it. Yeah, yes? It doesn't matter. Um, the theory argument, the, it doesn't matter where the theory arguments exist in the 2AC order, as long as you are clear um, and you slow down a little bit on theory arguments to be able to effectively communicate them to the judge. But order does not matter. Literally, the order does not matter. I could have presented this as if it was pot, so perm offense theory sovereignty, and it would have achieved the same desired results. So it does not matter where theory comes in the debate, but it does matter that theory exists. You should have a theory argument in the debate. So you can read arguments as to why each of these different theoretical statuses is bad. The affirmative team can present arguments as to why reading your counter plan conditionally unconditionally or dispositionally is a bad idea. And that should be present in the 2AC. Conditionality may not be a 2 and R option for you. And this lecture is not at all about how to debate conditionality, right? I think Beavis gave a seminar and a relective last night about how to debate conditionality. So hopefully you went and learned a little bit more about that. But that's something you can also ask lab leaders about how to debate it, how to go for it. I think that going for it is a you know, like total Hail Mary, it's the ripcord, it's the very last option here. Um, but putting it in the 2AC achieves what desired result? Like why put it in the 2AC? They have to answer it, right? It puts a little bit of pressure on the block to make sure that they spend some time <coughs> justifying their particular status. So in the same way that the 2AC reads it, I also sometimes suggest that the 1AR extend theory so that the 2NR has to eat up a bit of their time making sure that they answer it, right? They have to answer it. If they don't answer it, they're probably gonna lose this debate. So if they don't answer conditionality bad, like they're gonna lose. So it's something that they, a hundo E has to answer. So that is status theory. So we can read theoretical objections to the counter plan based on the status of the counter plan, when they can kick the counter plan. The other theory arguments that we can make uh, are theory arguments against the type of counterplan that they are reading. Now, I am not going to go very in depth on all of these different um, types of counterplans that you could read theory against, but just know that these ones are probably the most common for this year. And you can probably think of some that I don't have up here. So this is just a handful, it's a sampling of what is you know, out there. We're gonna talk a lot about these counter plans when we talk about counter plans on this topic, um, but I do just kind of wanna mention teams could attack a counter plan for being an agent counter plan. What's an agent counter plan? Yeah. Someone else does it? Someone else or like a different actor, sometimes called an actor counter plan. An agent counter plan would change the agent of the plan would change the organization or entity that carries out the plan. Agent counterplans are super common. 
One other thing I would say about this is that the different types of counter plans that I'm listing here sometimes tend to overlap with one another. Because like technically, if we had China do the plan, that's an international actor counter plan, but also like an agent counter plan. So you would just have to make sure that your argument kind of melded for both. So agent counter plans are when you change the agent of the plan. Um, international actor counter plans are when you have an international organization or state do the plan instead of the federal government. 50 state fiat is something I'll talk a lot more about, but 50 state fiat is a theory argument that you can make against the state's counter plan. Um, and it basically says that the 50 states being fiated to do some action is abusive. We talked about this in the elective that I gave. We talked about this, you know, you all should talk about this more in labs. My lab definitely has. But 50 state fiat is definitely a QEC argument that should be made against the state's counter plan. Uh, you can say that process counter plans are bad. What is a process counter plan? Yeah. When they change it, like how you do the plan, but the end result is the same. Um, give me an example. I get results in 100% of the time. So sure. I guess uh, if you said that you would do, uh, I don't know, I guess agent counter plans are kind of like that. Sort of. Um, yeah, agent counter plans change the agent. It maybe changes the process a little bit. But here I'll come with the process counter plan. Well, we ran a process counter plan called the Greece counter plan, where basically first we agreed to engage in China and take the stuff to get it back together, and then we did the plan for the first time. So it changes the way that the plan is carried out. Process counter plans tend to change the process by which the plan happens. So if your plan said the United States federal government should pass a piece of legislation that you know, funded school lunches, a process counter plan might, instead of passing a piece of legislation, do an executive order, might have the courts rule in a particular way, might recommend that proposal to an independent body that does some research about it and then decides whether or not it's a good idea. Process counter plans take the process by which your plan happens and changes it to do something else. Net benefits to this might be the process you use is bad and the process that the counter plan uses is good. Process counter plans tend to be pretty tricky um, because they do result in 100% of the act. So there's a definite theory argument that affirmatives can make that process counter plans are cheating because process counter plans steal the entirety of the act. There's hundreds of processes that you could use to do the plan, and so it's really hard to come up with like good affirmative responses to each different process. So process counter plans or having process theory is something that you should definitely read. Uh, consult counter plans were really common last year, maybe less common this year. Uh, there's a you know, formal consultation process that exists between the United States and Japan. There's one for NATO as well. Um, and so consulting another country made a lot of sense when it came to China policy. Might make a little less sense in um, education, but who knows? So you could also read that consult counter plans are bad when they read a consult counter plan. The final one is PICS. PICS stands for Plan Inclusive Counter Plans. A pick is just an argument that, you know, a part of the plan is a bad idea. Maybe a word that you said or an action that you took is a bad idea. Okay? Who can pull up and list for me the plan text that we read right now? Like, what's the packet <coughs> plan text? Do you have anything? Go ahead. Um, the United States federal government should mandate and provide funding for farm to school programs that specifically include service of fresh vegetables. All right, so there's a lot of stuff that that plan does, right? It mandates and increases funding for school lunch programs, and it makes other competitive foods illegal. There are a lot of things that I would pick out of in this plan text. I might not, I might pick out a funding. So just say mandate, but not fund. And then read like the spending that's that. I might uh, ban the like competitive 
foods. Like I, I might not do that portion. I might pick out of that portion and do the whole school lunch program except that portion. Picks are meant to kind of test all of the little intricate parts of your plan text. And if your plan text cites multiple things that you do, you should pre be prepared as the affirmative to defend each one of those things. Because if I'm the negative, I'm going to say one of those things that you do is a bad idea, and we shouldn't do it. So we should do the whole thing, but not that one part. We also talked about word picks. Maybe a word in the plan that you have is like, you know, a word we shouldn't use. We should use a different word instead. And I could use that to kind of craft a counter plan around as well. So if a pick is being read, you should obviously make theory arguments as to why picks are bad. They result in the same thing that the plan does. Um, they solve the entirety of the ask, and so they might, in the same vein as some of the other ones we've talked about, represent you know, a cheating type counter plan. The point of all of this was to make sure that you know about all of these types of genres of counter plans out there and know that it is acceptable for you to both read status theory arguments as well as theory arguments about the type of counter plan that they are reading. So you can read like condo bad and 50 state fiat bad. Questions? Yeah. Okay, if you're running state CP and they say that fiat's impossible, how do you answer that? It's not? What do you mean? Sorry, my answer is no, it's not. Like 50 state fiat is not impossible. Like they can say that the sky is orange, but like it's not. So you would just respond by saying, it is fine for us to do that. It's good for us to get education about 50 state action. It is core of the topic. It's the debate that's in the literature. It's predictable. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why allowing the 50 states to be part of the discussion of federal education policy. And so you can make all of those arguments as reasons why you get that counter. Just them coming up there and being like, it's impossible to do that, is like, no, it's not, you know? It's not like legal, it's not like impossible, it's totally legitimate, and something you can say. The other argument about that, and again, I'm not gonna go too far down the rabbit hole of just like 50 states, yes, no, but um, typically counter plans that do state action have the states act as one unified body. So when they see out the federal government, which is a makeup of a ton of different agencies and organizations and branches within one federal government, you are doing the same by saying that those 50 states would act in unison, just like the federal government acted in unison on the plan. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of kind of arguments that you can make there to, to combat that. Does anyone have any questions about the theory component? Okay. I'm going to move on to offense. The offensive component of the 2AC is just disadd. Disadd to action that the counter plan took. Disadd to action that the counter plan took. Okay, that's the first part. So you can read a disadd to the counter plan just like they read a disadd to your plan. If you prove that there are reasons why the counter plan is bad, then maybe we shouldn't do the counter plan. Just in the same way that if they prove there's a disadd to your app, we probably shouldn't do the counter plan. What's another type of <coughs> offense that we can read on the counter plan that's not a disadd? Something that is good about the plan, but not necessarily bad about the counter plan. Um, it, that's not what the affirmative would call it. It is sort of like an internal net benefit. It's sort of like that, but it's a thing that the affirmative does that's good that the counter plan can't solve for. What are those called? Yeah. An add-on. An add-on. Yes. Thank you, Parker. Nailed it. Okay. Add-ons. Add-ons <laughs> are really important for the affirmative because they represent things that the affirmative solves that the counter plan cannot solve. They're like cool little built-in solvency deficit. If you have add-ons that can get out of the counter plan or things the counter plan doesn't solve, you're going to be set. 
So like against the state's counter plan, what types of add-ons might we like wanna have? What would they be based on? Yeah. Stuff that only the federal government can do. Yeah, federal keywords, right. Yeah, federal keywords. So if you have add-ons based on federal action, then you're gonna be in a great spot versus the state's counter plan. So offense comes in two forms. You can read a disadd to the counter plan's action, or you can read an add-on the counter plan does not solve. Both of which would be totally acceptable versus counter plan. And you should make sure that you have some form of offense in the 2A state. One other caveat, or I think I'd like to say here, is that solvency deficits can also act as offense. Solvency deficits can act as offense. How can a solvency deficit be offense? It is a reason, but why is it a become why does it become a reason not to do the counter plan? Because it's just things that theoretically the plan does solve. Okay. The plan solves something. Who cares that the plan solves something? What's the impact to solving that thing? Yeah, the advantage, right? So if you identify something that the counter plan does not solve, and then you impact that thing with your advantage, it's like a disadd to the counter plan. Let's say for our affirmative in the packet, let's say that the state government cannot solve the like health advantage or like the health crisis advantage, healthcare advantage. That would become offense against the counter plan. <coughs> if the state government cannot solve it, it's a reason why the federal government doing the plan is a good idea and it becomes offense against the counter plan. So solvency deficits can be offense, add-ons can be offense, and this adds to the counter plan action can be offense. You should have some mix of offense in the debate. The act needs it. Last way the two AC answers is permutations. Permutations. There's a lot of different types of permutations that you can make, but what I want to say about permutations is that permutations have to include all of the plan and all or part of the counter plan. I'm gonna say that again. Permutations have to include all of the plan and all or part of the counter plan. That is a legitimate permutation. All of the plan and all or part of the counter plan. Counter plans that don't do all of the plan are called what? These counter plans are, or sorry, these permutations are severance perms. Yes, perfect. So if it doesn't do all the plan, it's severance. What if the permutation does something that is outside of both the counter plan and the plan? Like it does something that's neither in the plan nor in the counter plan. What's that called? Intrinsic perms. Let me explain those differences a little bit more. A severance perm is a perm that does not do the entirety of the plan. An intrinsic perm is a perm that includes something that is neither in the plan nor is it in the counter plan. Perm do both. Is it a legitimate permutation? Why? Someone said yes. Why? Yes. Yeah, it includes all the plan and all are part of the counter plan. So it's totally a legitimate permutation for you to say perm do both. As long as you included the entirety of the affirmative, then you're good to go. Does it include anything that's not in the counter plan nor in the plan? No. So that permutation is considered to be theoretically legitimate. What about perm do the counter plan? Yeah. Yeah, this one is up for debate, right? Because it's it is what the debate is about. The affirmative wants to contend that the counter plan and the plan are the same thing. So they say perm do the counter plan because the plan and the counter plan are the same thing. The negative would respond and say that that, that permutation is severance. 
because it severs the plant. They don't do the plant, they only do the counterplant. And if you're negative and you contend that there is a difference between the plant and the counterplant, then that permutation is severance. Questions about that? It's a little bit hard to understand, but that's what the debate would be about for that particular permutation. You would have to debate what is different about the plan and the counter plan. Sometimes you read definitions for T, sometimes you read contextual evidence to help prove this. It's a theory debate. Okay, yes? What about like perm do the app and the counter plan? Is that a severance term? Perm do the app first, yeah. then the counter plan. Mm -hmm. It's a delay permutation, and there are theory arguments as to why that perm is bad. Um, the affirmative could be like, well, we don't delay the app, but I could say that it's an intrinsic delay permutation because it includes a delay that's in neither the app nor in the counter plan. Um, and delaying the counter plan, I could also say, like, I would have other reasons why that permutation is bad, but my theory might be like delay intrinsic permutation. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the other permutation that I wanted to give an example of so we could do intrinsicness was perm for have the state and the federal government cooperatively do the plan. Like have them work together to do the plan. So again, obviously we're talking about the state's counter plan here. The plan is the federal government do school lunches. The counter plan is have the state governments do school lunches. And the permutation said that they should work cooperatively together. Is this permutation legitimate? Okay, you all think it is. Sure, because it does the plan and it does the counter plan. Sure. But what, why might it not be legitimate? Yes. It has a what access? What is it? Yeah, cooperation is something that is not in the plan, nor is it in the counter plan. So that component of that permutation is intrinsic. I'm going to say this again. So plan, federal government, counter plan state, permutation, cooperatively work together. That's different from do both, because do both would have one done at the state's level and one done at the federal level. Cooperatively work together is distinct. That permutation is intrinsic, because cooperation is neither in the plan text nor is it in the counter plan text. So it adds something that is in neither, so it is considered intrinsic. Again, all of these are up for debate. If you're affirmative and you make a perm do the counter plan, you could win that it's not severance because the perm, sorry, because the plan and the counter plan are the same. You could win these theory arguments. So even, you know, proposing these permutations doesn't really hurt you very much and you should definitely have a bunch of different permutations against the counter plan. It doesn't just need to be perm do both. It doesn't just need to be a single permutation. You should have multiple permutations if you are affirmative. Again, more things for the negative to have to answer. Questions, comments, concerns about that? So using the stop method, we can have a pretty good 2AC, and it's one that you can use as a template for every single counter plan. It's not like this only works against states or only works against, you know, private sector after counter plans. Like this is against every single thing. So as long as you have that template, you're going to be A-OK -okay in making sure that you have each and every piece to answer the counter plan. I want to talk just a little bit about extending a counter plan because I'm sort of running short on time here and I want to make sure there are time for questions. Uh, extending a counter plan is pretty simple. There's not a ton that you need to do that's different from any other flow. Okay? Um, you want to, oh, nope. I want to go back. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. You want to make sure that you have an overview for your counter plan. What would be included in this? And it is that overview, you have impact calculus. What do you have in this overview? What do we do in an overview for a counter plan? Say how it solves the app. Say how it solves the app. Very good. Right? 
you want to stand up and give the judge a brief synopsis of what the counterplan does and then why the counterplan solves the asset advantages. That's what the overview would include. In addition to this, extending a counterplan, you also need to remember line by line. You want to go and answer each argument that the affirmative has presented in the order in which they presented it. It's not a good idea to go to the counterplan, do your overview, and then jump to number four because you really want to answer theory first. And then jump back up to number one because next comes the permutations, right? It, it doesn't make sense to the judge when you do that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure that you're answering it in the order in which those arguments were presented. This applies to everything. Not just counterplans, but diff ads, but topicality, but case arguments, but critiques. Every single thing, you have to go line by line. You have to. And how do you figure out what was the order in which these arguments were presented? Flow. Flowing. It's the biggest thing. If you know how to flow, this is just like a side note and just you know the thing that I have to convey to you before I leave here. If you know how to flow, you will win debates. If you don't know how to flow, you will lose your debates. You will. You just will. Because you won't know what they said, you won't know how to answer it, and you know, you're know you in some trouble there. Another small side tangent about flowing, speech docs <coughs> are not your flows. That's not your flow. That's not a thing that you can use in place of a flow. I get it. It's super helpful. It's nice. It's neat. It's right there. They literally just read all those things, so why don't I just copy this? Well, what if they made an argument that is not on the flow? Or sorry, not on the speech doc. What if they skipped some arguments on the speech doc and you weren't paying attention? Either you're going to drop things or you're going to spend a bunch of time answering stuff that uh, you don't have to. You don't think it's ever going to happen to you. It's definitely going to happen to you. Learn how to flow. Flowing means line by line. And it helps when you're extending arguments, not just this ad, also counterplans, also critiques. It helps everywhere. So my second tip for extending a counterplan besides having an overview is make sure that you're going line by line. And then my third tip for extending a counterplan uh, is make sure you're using the rule of three to one. Who in here knows what the rule of three to one is? If you're in my lab, you for sure know what the rule of three to one is. Carrollton, tell us. They made one answer, you make three. The ratio for the block should look like that. When the 2HC makes a single answer, the block should have three responses to it. These responses could come in the form of indicting evidence, extending original pieces of evidence, and reading more evidence. And if you do this, you should end up with a super good ratio for yourself by the time the block is over. Because it means that like the 1AR has to answer three times as many arguments as was made by the 2AC. So that's like an excellent ratio for you to have uh, going into the 2NR. So you want to make sure that you are diversifying your responses, but having at least three to respond to each one that the affirmative made in the 2AC. These tips, again, are not standard for a counter plan. They should be for everything. For this ad, you should have an overview. Go line by line. Have the rule of three to one. There's nothing different or exciting in extending a counter plan that you need to know besides what your overview does. You should definitely answer the permutations, answer all of the permutations. You should answer the theory arguments that the other team has made, the solvency deficits that they have made, um, and just kind of make sure that you're covering your bases. One tip that I can give about theory, because again, I'm not going to go super in depth in debating theory, is you want to make sure that your responses to what the affirmative has said is specific. Specific. Right? If you stand if they stand up and read their conditionality block, and you stand up and read your conditionality block back, none of it matches up. It's super ineffective. It's just wasted time. It's a better strategy 
to have your offensive component and then respond directly to their offense. You have to be specific when answering theory. So I guess that is my fourth tip with extending a counter plan. Get as specific as you possibly can. Specifically answer the warrants in each of their solvency deficits. Specifically answer each term. Make your theory blocks apply to their theory blocks. Make sure that you're answering each argument in the order in which it was presented. Okay? Does anyone have any questions about reading a counter plan, answering a counter plan, or extending a counter plan? Because I was going to move on. Yeah? Is this thing still saying that, like, as a term, do the plan in conjunction with the counter plan? What does that mean, though? That's just like, I mean, first, I would ask in process, what does that mean, right? Because in conjunction just seems like a fancy word for at the same time. So is this perm do both? Or is this perm do the plan and have the federal government, like, is it going to be a cooperative perm? Then, you know, that changes your answers, right? Because perm do both, your answer is going to be like, this links to the net benefit and doing both is bad. Your perm for cooperation is probably going to have links to the net benefit, cooperation bad, and this is an intrinsic permutation. So clarify, right? In the same way that the, like, 1A clarifies what the counter plan does, it's totally a good idea for the block to clarify what the counter or what the permutations do. Because, you know, they can ramble off, like, six permutations, and you might have missed them or you might have missed what they do. So definitely asking in process is a good pro tip. Any other questions on how to debate and or extend a counter plan? So I'm going to talk about some counter plans on the topic. Okay, great. Counter plans on the topic um, are going to be pretty diverse, and this is not a total comprehensive list. So in no way, shape, or form is this, you know, the whole thing. I didn't make the topic. I don't run the topic. You know, so if so there's a counter plan that I missed, you know, like, whatever. You know, it's going to happen. The biggest counter plan on the topic is for sure going to be the state's counter plan. It's my whole job here. <laughs> this is the ND Institute, and I am the state's counter plan expert. I've given a lecture to my lab on it. I've given a seminar or elective to you all on it. I'm talking about it again. It's my whole thing. So I think the state's counter plan is going to be the biggest one. Education, traditionally held in the hands of the state. So, like, why not? Why would the federal government do it? It's a debate, though. It's a debate. It exists in the literature. It is, like, the central thing as to who should get to do it, federal or state. And it's going to be huge this year. I feel like now that I've said this, like, it won't be, and no one will read it just to, like, spite me or something. But I'm pretty sure people are going to read the counter plan. Um, state counter plans in our packet, you all should be pretty familiar with it. Hopefully you're going to have some practice speeches and practice debates about it. But I think it's sort of the best strategy. The affirmative team is going to be able to answer this by having a federal key warrant. They have to have a reason why the federal government is important to do the ask, um, or else they're going to lose that debate. There's a lot of theory arguments that can be made about it. Um, like I said, there's a debate to be had about whether or not the states can actually solve, whether the states have money to do it. There are disads to state action. So the affirmative is not totally at, in a bad place about this, um, but the negative can do a lot of really interesting and creative things to kind of get away with uh, murder on the state's counter plan. I think the state's counter plan is going to win every single debate next year or this year. Pretty sure. If I was negative, I'd go for the state's counter plan in almost every debate. I think it's a really good idea. And I think we'll probably win. But we'll see. Uh, one thing I will say about the states is that the more the state's counter plan attempts to solve of the app, the more it will probably be cheating. Uh, and so theory is probably going to be a good strategy against the state's counter plan. That would be my recommendation to you. Another big counter plan I think this year is going to be a private actor counter plan. Um, another section of the literature, and when I say the literature, I mean just like stuff written about education policy also points to private actors implementing or funding education in America. There are a lot of private entities that already do education policy in America. 
um, and private actors could step in to fill some of the shortcomings from either the state or the federal government. So it is conceivable that there is a counter plan that exists that would have um, of the private sector step in to do the plan. Net benefits to this can include just you know federal action, bad. This ad's based on federal action. Um, it could, there could also be a spending this ad. We don't want to spend money from the federal budget, but private companies would be good at doing that. And then there's some internal net benefits to having the private sector do our education instead of the federal government. So, you know, don't be surprised if the private actor counter plan um, exists on the topic. Um, I'm gonna drop down to the bottom here. Agent counter plans are a thing on this topic. So we could change the agent that does the plan. Um, if the plan says the United States federal government and the counter plan is an agent of the federal government, I'm not sure how that counter plan is super competitive. But if your counter plan, or sorry, if your app is about the like Supreme Court, then a counter plan about Congress is competitive. Does that make sense? Did you all kind of think that there would be Supreme Court apps? That's definitely going to be a thing on the topic. A lot of camps are writing Supreme Court based affirmatives. And so it would have the Supreme Court make a ruling about something education related. And then, you know, would read advantages about that. A different way we could do it is not have the courts rule, but instead have the Congress <coughs> rule. So we could read a counter plan that does that. Uh, in the same vein, you could have the courts make a ruling instead of having Congress do it. So the courts counter plan exists in the same way that an agent counter plan exists. You're going to see that quite a bit. People aren't going to ignore the courts section of the topic. And if they've already prepared it in one way, like if, they've, if they read it as an app, it makes a lot of sense that they would read it as a counter plan. Camps are gonna put out literature about the courts. So it's not something that you can at all ignore. It will definitely be a counter plan that is going to exist on this topic. Process counter plans will also exist. So they will just try to change the way that your plan happens. Process counter plans will exist on every single topic, um, and they will be annoying on every single topic. You'll have to think about, you know, how to answer them. Typically, you answer them with time-sensitive advantages. Uh, but just like on the China topic, process counter plans will exist on this topic, especially because it is a domestic topic. The last two I want to talk a little bit about um, is offset and advantage area. So offsets, does anyone know what an offsets counter plan is? What does the word offset mean? No one's heard that word before, we don't know. We can't take a stab at it. Can't guess, offset. Okay. The offset counter plan um, would be a counter plan that if the plan increases in one area, the counter plan would decrease in another area if that makes sense to you. So it would have to, to balance out the amount of money spent or the amount of new programs that exist, it would increase in one area and decrease in another in order to keep something stable or you know the same across the board. So if the plan increases funding for school lunches, the counter plan would increase funding for school lunches but decrease funding for something else in order to pay for it. Is it kind of like a trade-off kind of It thing? is, yeah. And then there'd be an internal net benefit about that trade-off. Yes? How accessible is that to like currency voters and stuff? Totally. Yeah. Right? It's a theory debate for sure. The utility of offsets is that it's good against new affirmatives. Or affirmatives you might not have anything prepared to debate. So you could always have the offsets counter plan in, in the box because the plan has to either regulate or fund something. So offsets works against that section of the topic. Um, it's a good generic counter plan. It's definitely susceptible to theory, um, but if you're not ready to debate it, you're gonna be in some trouble there to be able to do it. I'd say offsets is probably as common as maybe a process counter plan. 
I don't think that camps are going to spend a lot of time working on this. This might be something that you hear during the year, but maybe infrequently. Again, I'm trying to be a fortune teller and try to predict where the topic's going to go. Um, but I would guess that it appears, but it's not everybody's A strategy. Yes? Did you want to go on the trade-off meeting with the cost of counsel? Yeah, typically that'll be like an internal net benefit. Um, I mean, it could be an external net benefit. You could plan trades off with whatever it is. Um, but it might just be like cutting from this area to fund the plan is a good idea. That would be the internal net benefit component. The last one is just something you hear every single year, but I thought that I would mention it. It is advantage area counter plans. These types of counter plans um, just are meant to solve one advantage at a time. And they are things that could be literally anything. Yes? Are we looking at like plant counter plans? Sure. I mean, plant counter plans are super vague because counter plans all have planks. Like they all have portions of the counter plan that say what they do. Uh, but I could throw together like two advantage area counter plans to make a counter plan that solves your app. And each one would represent a distinct counter plan and they would be like planks. So yes. Yeah, so whatever you've heard is definitely, we're on the same page, we're talking about the same thing. So if I am debating an affirmative that has an economy impact and a hedge impact, so an advantage about the economy and an advantage about hegemony, I could read a counter plan that does two things. One that solves the economy and one that solves US hegemony. And I just kind of pasted those together in order to have a counter plan that solves your app. Advantage area counter plans are recycled from year to year. So, you know, if somebody advocates some policy to solve the economy and it shows up as a counter plan, it doesn't matter what topic it exists on, it's going to be relevant. Advantage area counter plans are nice because what if you debate a team who has an advantage you can solve for and you want to impact turn the other advantage? So you only want to solve for one part of the advantage. The rest of the counter plans that I sort of listed up here besides advantage area solve for the whole case or are meant to solve for the whole thing. Advantage area counter plans just solve one advantage at a time. You can paste together as many advantage area counter plans as you'd like, and they all sort of act as one entity. Does anyone have any questions about that particular thing? This, thing, this concept's a little bit confusing, but you know, somebody may read a counter plan to solve warming and then impact turn your hedge advantage. Does that make sense? So you can kind of pick and choose and piece things together. So that is my sampling of what is going to appear on the topic. <clears throat> Obviously, there's going to be more. I haven't seen everything that is out there that has, you know, been to offer most camps haven't put out any of their items yet, so we don't know for sure what it's gonna look like. But based on my experience, I think the state's counter plan is gonna be the heavy favorite. I think private actor counter plans are gonna be important here. Um, and you're gonna have to know some processy stuff like courts and agent 